Okay, guys, so can everybody hear me okay? Now, I've muted you guys because we can hear all the sounds, okay? If the dog's barking, everybody can hear. So if you want to speak, just put your hand up or unmute yourself and speak. Yeah? Okay. So, what I like to do when I'm running a course, and this is the first evening, my sense is that I want to give the people on the course an experience that they have probably never had and may not get again. And for me, that's done um, very simply. We start off, in a, I start off in a particular way, and I'm not suggesting you do this, but I find it's a really useful way of starting, and that's with doing nothing. <laughs> so, we meet before the introductions, We will do that for 30 seconds or a minute. And it's the last thing they're expecting. Because what, what are they expecting? Feel free to unmute yourself at any time and pipe up, okay? They're expecting almost immediately lots of words. And when you start something like this, you can actually see some people in the room looking round at each other. And then, you know, and you don't you don't make it, you you don't make yourself feel too uncomfortable or they're not too uncomfortable, but what you want to do then after 30 seconds or a minute, you might just, I say, so what did you, what happened then when we had that quiet moment? Then that gets them to reflect on their experience. Oh, um, I felt uncomfortable. Oh, I felt calm. I noticed the sound of the traffic. I thought you'd, you're on drugs or something. <laughs> it just, I thought you'd lost it. I, I was wondering if you were okay. It doesn't matter. What then happens is you've got people to reflect on their experience and that is mindfulness. You've introduced them to the practice, to mindfulness without even mentioning the word so you start off with a taste of it it's like having a taste of water instead of talking about it Now, that's, I, that's how I start off most of my courses, even the first week. And people remember it. And you start off with, for me, what is the most important thing or as important? It's not the words and the information that's only important. 
It's the space. We forget it. In our urge to give people their money's worth, we want to give them lots of information. And guys that can get that anywhere. What they can get is that. Is everybody with me? That's very unusual in today's sort of um, noisy, talky, wordy world. Even in a world of mindfulness, it's a lot about information, about um, concepts. But see how simple it is. It's not complicated. For me, mindfulness is beautiful. There's a beauty to it. And for me, there are three pillars to a good, to good mindfulness teaching. Keep it simple, keep it elegant and practical. Those are the three pillars that I sort of always come back to. And just in that, just in the first five minutes there, you've, you've encapsulated the, all, all three of them. It's simple. It's elegant because you've not been rushing in with lots of, you've left some space. And it's practical. You've shown people, well, here, look, we stopped doing something and you noticed what was going on. Or you noticed that you didn't notice. It doesn't matter. If anybody's got any comments or questions, please do ask. Otherwise, I'll, you know, I'll just carry on. For me, I want to um, I want to give my students my my I call them students. I want to I want to give them an experience that they won't forget, and one which will have an impact. <clears throat> I'm not saying it's the only way; it isn't the only way. I I one of my teachers talked about elegance as what you leave out. So when we, if you're preparing for your class, ask yourself, what am I prepared to leave out? <laughs> the tendency is to put more in. I need to tell them this. I need to tell, oh, what about that? So we stuff that in. What about, so we, so we, we prize it up and we cram something else in. And the, the whole evening can be crammed up with activity and ideas and concepts. To, to keep it elegant, we have to take things out. Things look beautiful or things look, you can see the whole of something when it's got space around it. If it's overlapping with everything else, you can't see it. And it's the same with the ideas around mind. We, we put out an idea when we talk about acceptance or uh, we may um, talk about how to work with thoughts or the nature of thought, whatever. And then you leave a short pause. Then that short pause, I mean, not only sort of brings, it sort of, um, it, it contains that idea to con like that the pausing, the silence, the stillness is a container for it, but it allows the students to absorb what's been said to our own. Interesting. 
just like throwing a pebble into a pond. It goes down and then it, up, it um, upsets the mud at the bottom. And then after a while it settles again. It's no good just throwing a pebble into a pond, then another one, another one, another one, another one, another one, another one, another one. Another one. So that that is the that is the way I share mindfulness in a in a way that's um, got space around each idea, each concept each teaching and I, I, I love it because I, I see the impact people are not expecting it even if you use flip charts or um, powerpoints I don't myself but you can do it's still the same principle whether there's you know, 10 people in the room or 100. If anybody has any questions, any Anything they brought here or they want to discuss, please feel free. And there is also a chat function if you want to use that. I better pull it up. Ah. Good evening. Ah, yeah. Okay. Hi, Yosta here. Hi, Yosta. Hello. Um, I'm just curious whether um, the responses that you get from doing this. Are they the same for uh, different generations? I'm, I'm asking because I'm working a lot with um, millennial type of mm -hmm. generation and... <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that one. <laughs> I, no, Yosta, I think that's a great opportunity you've got with the millennials. <laughs> they can't, they're not a generation that can sit still very well I don't mean that unkindly uh, yeah at all. but you've got a great opportunity to show them that there's a different way of being yeah even if it's for 30 seconds or a minute every few minutes so the material is important obviously the information is important but what we do, we build the material around the pauses. The pauses are not just incidentals. Yeah. They're part of the teaching. Yeah. So with the millennials, I would I would go for it. See what what you're doing when somebody comes to along to a a class they've come along for you to help them they've come along for you to challenge them and yes. it's your job to challenge them you, know, you just need a little bit of pushing a little bit of challenge and that as soon as you walk into the room they get that little bit of challenge and like why isn't she talking what's the matter with her yeah is she all right well, then that is what they notice when you ask. Yeah, it's, go it, it, it sounds fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Don't start off with lots of. Yeah, well, I'm not saying don't. No, you do it. I'm just <laughs> suggesting. And you might feel uncomfortable. Well, that's your practice. Don't, yeah, exactly. don't, don't be silly. Don't. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So I've got another question here. When I do my first session, I seem to go red and find it quite hard to do the pause. I would love to do it, but maybe I need to meditate more on it. Yes and no. 
Um, I think if you did it, okay, let's start with something small. If you feel too uncomfortable, start with 10 seconds. Okay, so if you find it really uncomfortable, start with 10 seconds. Or start with 10 seconds, then have a little bit of chat, then do 20 seconds. So you're working your way into it. It's not too obvious. So you start to eat it, nibble away at the edges of this uncomfortable feeling. You start to, instead of jumping straight in with a minute or 30 seconds, just do 10 seconds and pretend you're doing something. Just pretend. <laughs> you can pretend. Pretend you, you're looking up something. <laughs> just so you you can play a little bit don't be frightened to play they're they're waiting for you they're just waiting for you that's what they're there for they're waiting for you 10 seconds then say a little bit maybe okay so we're going to have um some introductions in a few moments but maybe we're you might want to tell them that you're going to do it. If you feel uncomfortable not telling them, just say, we'll just have a few moments of quiet. Not even meditation. And then you telling them might take the pressure off you a little bit. Then as you become more confident, you, you needn't tell them. I tend not to tell them nowadays. And, and, and yeah, that, that's fine. You can set it up. It has more of an impact if you don't, but you've got to take yourself into account. Don't make yourself feel too uncomfortable. I hope that's been helpful. Mm. Oh, yeah. So um, I think Angela is trying to say something, but her mic is not oh, working. Okay, thanks, Angela. She's not. She's not on the uh, grid. Where have you gone, Angela? Ah, oh, there, down there. Ah, there. Uh, <coughs> you're not muted, Angela. Can you? Can we hear you? Try again. No, I can't hear you, Angela. Have you got your mic on? Okay, you do the chat. Yeah, we haven't got you muted, Angela. Can't hear Angela. You'll have to type a chat if you want to ask anything else. No. Okay. Sorry, Angela, we can't hear you. Oh, there. Try that. No. No. But you might use a chat. Okay. So what is it we're trying? What's the purpose of the whole thing about teaching mindfulness? If we go back to the original motivation for developing mindfulness, if we go back to the time of the Buddha and, and Buddhism, which you know that's where it came from, it's to alleviate our suffering. Because we all suffer. And it's alleviating our distress, our suffering. So 
that is the, the whole purpose of what we're sharing. If you have that at the back of your mind, not that you need to even mention it like that, but that is the purpose. And so that what gets us out of our suffering is only one thing. Awareness. Without awareness, we're knackered. <laughs> Without awareness, it doesn't, you know, that's, that's the purpose of it. So all the time we're pointing people back to their own experience. That's what we're engaged with. So, you, you know, you might get into a little bit of some theory and, and academic stuff, and that's fine. It's got its place. It, it's interesting. But for me, we're always coming back to... We, we suffer, we, we have distress, and we want to end it. Every person who walks through that door wants, wants more ease in their life. And who creates the dis-ease? Who creates the distress themselves? So it's getting them to see how their own thinking, it's created in two ways. Actually, what we're working with are two aspects of the human being. And that is, there are thoughts and bodily sensations. There's nothing outside of them. So we keep it simple. A while ago, I was having sort of doing some supervision with somebody. And she said that. Um, Someone in her class didn't get. Two people said, oh, I just don't get it. I'll come back to that, Angela. I just don't get it. I just don't get mindfulness. Two people. And she'd been explaining and explaining lots of words. <laughs> and, uh, and then... I said, what did you do then? She said, oh, well, I tried to explain it more. And I, I sort of fell for it because she was just, I could tell she tied herself up in knots. So if you go back to the first pillar of mindfulness teaching, simplicity. For those of you who missed it, simplicity, elegance, and pra practical. Keep it practical with the three pillars. Instead of going into elaborate explanations, how about taking your attention to your contact with the chair right now? Feel that contact with the chair. What's to get or not get about that? What that does, it stops people from, because <laughs> people want to, <laughs> yeah, but, so you bring them back, well, you can't argue, there's nothing to argue about with your contact with the chair. And it stops people for a few, a little while, it stops there. And so that's a way of keeping it simple. Always coming back to the simplicity of this moment. That's where we want to be. Not hit them overhead with it, but we just bring them back to the moment. What's happening? So you're sitting on the chair, your, your sensation of sitting on the chair is not a concept. It doesn't need explaining. It doesn't need pulling apart. 
It's a direct experience of now. Now, people may say, yeah, but, you know, during the day I'm sort of lost in thoughts and and then we can talk around how to work with thoughts. I use thought labelling. Is everybody familiar with thought labelling? Yeah. I use thought labelling. And the fact that what we are... See, one of the mistakes we make, particularly in daily life is that is this idea of trying to be mindful trying to be aware it's a subtle effort to be aware but you you stop being aware right now it's impossible isn't it did you stop being aware did, put your hand up if you stop being aware and if you did, I want to know how you knew. So what we do, we start from there. That's the baseline. You're already aware. So we don't have to try to be aware. What we do, and this is what my teacher explained to me many years ago, and I didn't get it at first. She said, what you do is you notice what takes you away from being present and aware. Well, isn't that slightly different? And what is it that takes us away? Thoughts. Only 100% of the time is it thoughts. So, you, you know, you might see people in your class sort of trying to, how do you, they, they might be a bit furrowed browed, and you know, they're trying, they're really trying, bless them, and they're really sincere. But we can relax because we're, it's already here. Just relax into the awareness now. And from there, we can notice what takes us away. So when we're having a shower, brushing our teeth, drinking a cup of tea, something takes us away from it. It's our stories. Always the stories that take us away. Because what happens is um, thoughts, the sort of right in the center of a thought, as it were, there's a kernel of a story, an identity, mm. right in the, as it were, in, in, in the center of a thought. And what that does, that is what we, we are. Um, seduced by or for want of a better term we're seduced by this story this kernel <gasps> and they keep taking us away i'm not talking about practical and functional thinking here it's different and so we're always just noticing and it's not what we notice in a very sort of neutral even a non-emotional way. Mm -hmm. Of course, first of all, we tend to judge ourselves, which is just another thought.
Okay, I'm just going to come to a couple of questions here. I was just going to say, is it best not to make eye contact? Good question. I tend not to make eye contact. I don't want to make people feel too uncomfortable. I might just scan. <laughs> just, but I, yeah, I don't tend to make eye contact in that silence. I tend to look down. And the thing is with that, if there's people still talking, when I look down, it, it sends a signal and they pick up on it sooner or later. But don't make yourself feel too uncomfortable. Build up to it. How can you motivate a group to practice at home more we were on the second session, only two people out of 14 had done any practice. Well, first of all, um, not everybody does. And I don't worry about it. In a sense, I do what I do. And I, I tend not to worry about, okay, let me put it another way. What I talk about in this, and you, some of you might have heard me talk about it, is that mindfulness is like, it, it's medicine. And, it, I, 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 and I say this on the first week. I say to them, if you go to the doctor, and the doctor gives you some medicine, and you don't take the medicine, can you go back and tell us, say to the doctor, hey, I'm not well. So something like it puts it in, it puts it in, the ball in their court. They've got to be responsible for it. I'm not responsible for them practicing or not practicing. <clears throat> I'm, I, I'm giving them the medicine in the best way possible, but it's up to them to take it away and to take it. That's how I tend to deal with that. And I tend to preempt it. Often I will say that on the first week. And also, I sometimes build on it. I tell them that when I was a, a little boy, my mum used to take me to the doctors and give me medicine. Did the medicine taste nice? Not always. But it made me well. And it's the same with mindfulness. We might sit down. It doesn't always feel good. But it helps us be well. Does that help? I would preempt it. Another thing. <laughs> I, I say, look. You have to meditate every day, absolutely every day, except when you don't. <laughs> so you, you, you sort of saying it's important to meditate, but it is also it's okay not to. Because once they've missed, they've missed a day. It doesn't matter. It's that paradox. Just meditate every day. When you don't, though, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So... You're saying yes, and you're saying it's okay. Yes, it's okay not to. Yes, it's okay not to. I wouldn't try to convince people to meditate every day. Anything else? Another area is, um, we're not covering too much ground here, are we guys? 
No. Okay. Hmm. On our teacher training retreat, we um were a bit cheeky because when we sometimes say, depending on the group, but we sometimes say, if you use a certain word, we're going to ask you to explain what we mean, what you mean by them. And those certain words are what I call cliches. So cliches, mindfulness is, it, they're common in mindfulness. Not that we shouldn't use them, but it's just getting behind them. So it's things like acceptance. Um, sit with it. That's a good one. Um, be kind to yourself. Com Self-compassion. Um, mindfulness can be a cliche. So I think one of the most common ones is acceptance. And I often hear it in relation to somebody who might be going through a little bit of a difficult time. <laughs> Hello, we can't hear you, all right. So we... Yeah, people might be having a difficult time, they might be sad or whatever it is. And, and we want to say more than acceptance, guys. Is everybody with me here? It's very easy to say. So we get behind it. What does acceptance mean? Okay. Okay. So acceptance, in a sense, it's something we do. In, in a sense, it's something we do. So let's suppose that we feel uncomfortable. We have a discomfort. We have a discomfort, uh, an uncomfortable sensation or might be a tightness or sadness it doesn't matter we feel uncomfortable what does it mean to accept it the key is in curiosity that's that's the key so we become curious about the sensation or whatever it is, that the feeling of tightness or um, resentment or frustration, whatever it is. We start to become curious about it. And what I ask is, can you describe this sensation, describe three qualities of this sensation? First of all, where do you feel it? Now, why do we do that? Because if I have to ask myself, where do I feel this? It moves me, in a sense, out of it. I have to look for it. Ooh. It makes me curious. And if I'm curious, I can't be lost in my thoughts about it. Oh, God, I hate this. Oh, I just wanted to go away. I've had enough. Da, 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 da. Which doesn't help. It it's just piles the the it just piles up the distress. But if I ask, where where do I feel it? I'm sort of out of it. I'm looking at it as an object, maybe something like this. It becomes something that's more objective. This takes a little bit of practice, but that's what we're doing. We pre it's mindfulness practice. <laughs> That's what we need to do. <laughs> and then if they can locate it, even if it's, oh, yeah, it's in the chest, it might not be so, oh, it's the throat. It might be more amorphous than that. That's fine. Then we can ask, okay, so what does it feel like? 
a great question. Has it got a texture? Oh. Is it heavy? Is it light? So what you're getting them to do, rather than getting lost in their views and opinions about it and their judgments and their beliefs, what you're doing, you're getting them to explore it as a present moment something. That's what acceptance is. It's a way of holding something in awareness. So then you... You move beyond the, the, mere, the mere word to getting, be, getting behind it. Anybody got any questions? Comments? Yosta again. <laughs> Yosta. Hello. Um, I've noticed many times that when I ask the question, so where, where do you feel it? In the, or do you feel that somewhere in the body? That people tend to then still go into their thoughts. So what would be, how, how can I best approach that? Okay. Yes, it's very common. A lot of people don't know the difference between a feeling sensation and a thought. That's where we start. First of all, this is your so this is mindfulness practice. It's something that we get a ah, okay. And you can tell by the language they use, which you which obviously you are, that they're it's still in their thoughts. So something that I use. And it still takes practice, but something that I use, I'll say to people, right, take your, I want you to think about your right foot. So I want you to think about it. Five toes, nails, a few wrinkles, an arch and a heel, a bit of cracked skin. So I ask them to think about it. Then I'll say to them, okay, dis discard that, we're not interested in that. Okay? Okay, so next I'll ask the, okay, now what I want you to do, I want you to visualize and picture your foot. Ah, so they picture it, five toes, gaps between the toes, toenails, maybe some hairs or a little dark patch on the heel, the, the, the arch. Ah, yeah, the shape. Ah, yeah. Okay, okay, discard that. We're not interested in the picture of it. Now I want you to feel your foot. And if you've still got five toes, you're, you're still either thinking or imagining in your foot. Are you with me? If you feel your foot now, just feel it. You don't have five toes. It's just an, an amorphous mass of energy. Am I right? Then you can go into your imagination and, oh yeah, so it's the latter one we want. But it still takes practice. But at least you're giving them something then to work with. Because what we're wanting is a, um, a direct experience of the body. Not one that's mediated by thinking. Good question. Does that help? It's a, it's a good little thing to bring in because even if somebody doesn't ask that question, that's where they'll be. Yeah. It, it even makes me wonder whether that's, and I know you just said don't cram too much content in your teachings, but perhaps this would be worthwhile of, of a, a some form of introduction in the first week. Yeah. Yeah. 
but you have to leave something else out. Yeah. <laughs> or we'll continue for four hours. <laughs> Because we, we, we're not used to having a direct experience of life, see, we, we, we're used to living through concepts. You know, the, the I is a concept. The self is a concept. Time is a concept. You look for um, time, and there's nothing there. But this is for week eight, right? Not week one. <laughs> <laughs> this is for you guys, not for. Yeah. But you're still sometimes. You'd be surprised. It comes up. And so if it comes up, I, I, I'll go with it. I, I don't underestimate. I wouldn't underestimate the students. Some of them are sort of ready for something. And my sense is a lot of people, they want to be challenged. Anything else? Um, yeah, hi, hi there. I was just wondering, um, you were mentioning three qualities of sensation, and I've got down, where do you feel it? What does it feel like? I don't seem to have a third. Okay. I don't know if I've missed that. Okay, what I was asking, was um, if they can identify three, um, say, characteristics of this sensation. Yes. So it might be, oh, it feels warm, it feels um, jumpy, and it sort of feels like spacious, or feels heavy, or feels right. light, yeah? Yes, thank you. So you're looking for them to offer kind of three. I'm with it. Thank you. So you're getting them to do the investigation. Yes, yes. Thank you. That often comes out on um, on our course on week five when we, we're doing Dance with Dragons, working with difficulties. But it might come out before. Okay, thank you. One teacher calls it um, naming what's true. So you ask them to name what's true about this particular thing. What is actually true about it? I'll come back to that. So what's actually true about it? It feels like, oh yeah, it feels heavy. That is what's actually true about it. My opinions and judgments and beliefs are not true. But they're what I believe because they are my beliefs. It's going to be around forever. It never goes. It's solid. Because that's the belief, isn't it? If something's hurting, we believe it's solid. I can't stand this anymore. I hate it. They're really un unhelpful thoughts and habits to get into. And that's what we're, we're showing people how to come out of that into a more healthy way of doing our experience.
Someone said today, I found the body scan helps when I can't sleep. It's great. If I wake up in the night, I start it and fall asleep. It seems wrong to each practice as a sleep aid. What are your thoughts on this? I think if somebody is in bed, they want to sleep, I think that's fine. Yeah. But you brought up an interesting point, Sharon, because, and this is just my view, guys. I'm not asking you to do this. I tend to not ask people to lie down when they do the body scan, or what I call a being at home meditation. Why? For that reason. If someone's got an ailment, a bad back, then fine, of course. Or if I'm working with people in a host, you know, who are vulnerable or ill health, fine. But if they're not, I ask people to sit up. Or I didn't. I don't even mention lying down. Now, again, my wife, she's a bit rebel. She will, because <laughs> just <laughs> just because she doesn't, you know, it's 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 her way, and I think other people do. But I just prefer the sit up. It it lends itself for me to awareness rather than going drowsy. But you choose. I think it's because I come from the Buddhist tradition. Well, we, we don't tend to do that. We tend to always sit in meditation. Yeah, so I think that's from that perspective. Anything else? We haven't touched on inquiry this week, but that can be for another week. It's an interesting area. We can look at that next week. What about any other cliches you can think of? Things that it's very easy to say. And you know, whilst you're saying them, that hmm, there's more to this. without judgment. Yes. Someone's just wrote in, without judgment. Can everybody see the chat? Yeah, okay, good, yeah. Now, yes, but doesn't judgment happen? Yeah, exactly. Judgment happens, so what, what can we do? The best I can do is to be aware of my judgment and not feed into it. That's the best I can do, because I'm not in control of my thoughts most of the time. There's a wonderful book called Don't Take Your um, Life Personally, and you could say Don't Take Your Thoughts Personally. Because they, they, you know, they, they just happen. Just sitting there and they all just, they just go. Not so another week, guys. We can talk about guided meditations if you want to. How you know, sort of um, again? I I keep them simple. I don't do anything fancy. I'm not trying to give people an experience when I'm guiding a meditation. 
they they're having their experience my work is to facilitate them being aware of it i'm not trying to create one for them which which can be a tendency we want to get into want want people to have a nice experience that's understandable And if there's somebody really vulnerable and the only time they get some relief is in meditation with a nice experience, then go for it. I wouldn't take that away from anybody. But the average person walks through our doors here. You know, my work is to facil facilitate them becoming aware of themselves. So then it makes my job easier for guiding a meditation. I'm not thinking of all these fancy things to say and trying to do this and spin that and give them that experience and make them feel like getting in touch with the cosmic love child within and you know it's not that's not my job so it's easy so all my job is to just drop in a pointer we can say more about this next week actually as we come to the end any final questions, guys? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we can. I notice I can get very active when people say that they can be relaxed after the meditation. Yeah. The chick. I remember Thich Nhat Hanh said that the change should be hatched as the chicken hatches the egg. Yeah, it's nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, then, if we react when somebody um, say they feel relaxed after meditation, what's wrong with feeling relaxed? You've set something up. So it's not about, oh, it's, people think it's about relax. Oh, so no, so it's not about relaxation. Yeah. If someone feels relaxed after meditation, all I'll say, well, let's wait and see what happens next time. Yeah. Nice one, Rosella. It's not an idea and not a decision, it's a process. Yeah. And that's an interesting area. How does change happen? Because if, if we don't if we don't have that understanding, then we go about trying to change. Which is again using F so we don't change through effort. We change through awareness. Okay, guys. Thank you. Thank you, too. Thank you. It's, it's been lovely. I love it. I love your questions as well. And Thank you. See you next week, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye.